All right, we are live again with uh, another uh, part of our in interview series, and I'm very excited today. Uh, if folks follow our campaign, you know one of the biggest things that I've been pushing for last cycle and this cycle is uh, with this district, the fourth congressional district of Iowa being uh, the second most agriculture producing district uh, in the nation of enforcing our antitrust laws to allow our farmers to stay on their land and make a dime. And so uh, with that, what we're seeing right now in the time of COVID-19, there is a spotlight on our food system and uh, we can see some of the, the brokenness of it. And our guest today uh, is no stranger to that. And he's been fighting this for, for years and years. And so uh, with that, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Mike and Mike, would you like to introduce yourself and in, in sure? You no, know? yeah, yeah. I'm I'm Mike Calicrate. Uh, I'm coming to you this morning from Colorado Springs, where our meat plant is located, our processing plant, and also where our two retail stores and wholesale distribution center is located. Uh, I've lived in St. Francis, Kansas, for the last 45 or so years. Uh, I got out of uh, of Colorado State University in 1975 with an animal science degree. And I, and I always am careful to tell people, don't confuse the animal science degree with animal husbandry. Uh, and that's what it was in 1950, it was animal husbandry. And then we, we kind of took a different approach to agriculture and food and, and we called it animal science. And, and, and so I got out of Colorado State University in 1975 and went back to St. Francis, Kansas and uh, built my first feed yard there. I built two feed lots, uh, uh, one in 1978 with some partners and, and a second one in 1986 uh, uh, by myself uh, on the family place, on my wife's family's place. And, and so, you know, I, I left CSU fully, fully brainwashed uh, uh, about industrial agriculture. I mean, I wanted to be the biggest and the best and the fastest and the most throughput and the most economies of scale. And, you know, if there was a growth enhancing compound of some kind, I'd be the one of the first ones to use it. Uh, and and uh, so I started out in that business and in that first feedlot in 78. And it didn't take too long really uh, to, to realize what a tough business it was. And, and I recall in, in 1978, when we first opened what we call tri-state feeders at the time, the 14,000 head feedlot in St. Francis, the first one in, in that county. Uh, I'd come to work on Monday morning and there was likely a cattle buyer sitting outside the gate when I opened it. He might've even been taking a nap. <laughs> uh, but they, I had 20 buyers I could sell my fat cattle to. And it was pretty darn good times. And, and some of the guys that were partners in the feedlot had made a lot of money. Uh, in the, in the uh, early 70s feeding cattle. And, and, you know, we think of farmers, a lot of money, you, you've got to put it in perspective. It's actually not that much, but they did okay. Yeah. And they had some money to invest in a feedlot and, and be able to sell their corn and, and their, their farm production through the animals. And it made a whole lot of sense. Uh, but then as we headed off into the 80s, things really started to change. And uh, IBP started what, what the Wall Street Journal termed as their death march. And IBP was the biggest meat packer, Iowa beef processors. And they were the biggest meat packer and they put a plan together to basically eliminate the competition. They made a deal with the mafia in New York City to get boxed beef into the city. Uh, that's what really launched them from a company that almost couldn't pay their bills because they couldn't get their meat sold. And if they did sell it, they couldn't get the money. Uh, and, and they went to New York City, made that deal with the mafia. And as far as I know, it's still in place today. But uh, they, they went on their death march and they put out of business all, all these competitors that, that I used to be able to sell to. And so, you know, long story short, I end up uh, uh, suing the big meat packers in 1996, along with some other uh, plaintiffs in the case, cattle producers who had sold to IBP. And uh, we started that case winding its way through the courts and as a class action lawsuit. But but, but it was really in 88 when I first heard Bob Peterson, the president and CEO of IBP, speak at the Kansas Livestock Association's annual meeting that I got it. I mean, Bob Peterson basically said, look, you've got ConAgra, you've got Cargill, they're out there feeding their own cattle. And in Colorado, they, that company was known as Montford. And at the time, they had three feed yards each 
holding 100,000 cattle or more feeding into the feedlot or feeding into the slaughterhouse in, in Greeley, Colorado, where they've had such a big COVID problem recently. And, and they were feeding their own cattle. And then Cargill also had feedlots and they were feeding their own cattle. And IBP was the cash trader. And, and we didn't know it at the time, but IBP had agreed with the other packers to cooperate rather than compete. In fact, there were, there were cases where Cargill actually sold cattle to IBP to keep the cash market down. And, and so we had all this history of, of, which I learned as a result of the lawsuit and discovery, we had all this history of where these packers had been cooperating, not competing. And so just, just no antitrust law enforcement whatsoever. And, and that was really a result of the Reagan presidency. And re, the Reagan presidency basically took the, took the uh, position that we need big companies that can do business globally. We need fewer rules. We need fewer regulations. And just let them go. You know, just let these corporations get as big as they want. They wiped out the competition. They, they wiped out farm gate income. Uh, started rural America onto this steep decline into complete abject poverty. Some of the poorest people and hungriest people in the world now live in rural communities. Uh, we, we saw a decline in our environment. Uh, uh, we were mining the soils, mining the water, all for the benefit of a handful of global corporations. And this is where we are in Iowa is a mighty good example of that exact outcome. And, and so, uh, you know, our case worked its way through the courts. We finally got to the courtroom in Montgomery, Alabama in 2004, eight years later, which was too long, and, uh, and we won. The jury awarded us $1.28 billion uh, for IBP's, uh, it really admitted uh, market manipulation in the trial. And, and, uh, and, and you, you sensed it during the trial that, that the judge was not on our side. And, and of course, we tried to frame that up as well. He's, He's just making sure this case is solid for an appeal. And, and, but that turned out was not the case. And, and so winning the $1.28 billion didn't matter much to us. We wanted injunctive relief. We wanted to fix the market so that these big packers would have, wouldn't be able to steal from cattle producers any longer. Well, the judge started out giving the jury instructions based upon consumer antitrust law not producer antitrust law like in the Packers and Stockyards Act. He gave instructions more in line with the Sherman Clayton Act. And, and so it was gonna be very difficult for the jury to make their decision for the cattlemen in this case, but they did, they did it anyway. They gave us, they gave us the, uh, the, the, the case and the jury award. And, and within a very short time, the judge simply just reversed the jury verdict and he took it away. And, and he, in fact, not only took it away, we went from winning 1.28 billion in hopes for injunctive relief to having to pay a court ordered uh, court costs for Tyson, IBP. Tyson now had bought IBP. So the biggest poultry company now owns the biggest beef company. And uh, we had to pay $80,000 uh, of Tyson's court costs on top of, of the judge taking that jury award away. So we went on through the courts and of course, all these appeals courts are full of uh, Reagan appointees and other other you know appointees that 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 really don't believe in antitrust law enforcement because that was honestly it's still the way it is today even with the recent Trump appointees these these uh, Supreme Court justices do not believe in in uh, regulations and don't believe in antitrust law enforcement and John yeah. Roberts in particular was was one of those uh, and and basically they we our case made it to that court it made it to the Supreme Court where we were requesting that they hear the cattleman's case. And they said, look, there's two cases before us. There's the cattleman's case for fair markets. There's the Anna Nicole Smith family feud case. We're only gonna hear one of them. Hmm. But you know what they did? They heard the Anna Nicole Smith family feud case, which honestly didn't matter much. Uh, and they gave the green light to the big meat packers to plunder and pillage all they want. And here we are today, having lost half of our share of the consumer beef dollar from when we, from 1970, when we had, you know, a lot of meat packers in the country, feeding Americans. Do you want to repeat that? And in, in, uh, so, so folks can really understand what does that mean uh, that you, you met, you lost half? Oh, well, so in 1970, for example, uh, the, the cattle producer, and this is all based upon 
USDA data, and it's the same measurement as what is done in 1970 is done today. And, and basically what USDA does is, is they figure out at, at retail with the scanners, uh, what is the value of a, a, a beef, of meat that comes out of an animal? And what percent of that retail value is that farmer rancher receiving? And so back in 1970, that was anywhere from 65 to 70% of the retail dollar. And we had lots of meat packers in the country. Like I said, I had 20 that I could sell to. Denver, Colorado had a, had a couple. Pueblo had one. Sterling, Colorado had another. Uh, there, there were packers all over the place. And they were thriving. The feedlots were, were, were thriving. They were mostly small feedlots. They were mostly farmer feeder type lots where the farmer fed what he produced on the farm and the manure went back on the soil. So they were really ideal, ideal uh, sustainable type operations. They weren't these 100,000 head operations. And, and so uh, it, the, lots of retailers, lots of wholesalers, uh, com competitive markets. We, back in those days in the 1970s frame, we had meat cutters making good money. And I, I just remember I, I graduated high school in, in 69 and I had been working in the meat market at the local grocery store. And I remember the day I turned 16, I got my driver's license. I was so excited. And the manager of the meat market, his name was Ron. And Ron handed me the keys to his brand new four wheel drive Ford pickup. It was one of those tall ones, you know, that you could climb up into. And I thought, oh no, I was scared to even drive it, afraid I might wreck it. But he convinced me, he says, no, go ahead and take it for a spin. And I drove it to Kittredge down the canyon and back into Evergreen. And I was just, uh, I was just so honored that he would let me drive his brand new pickup. But the point I'm making is he had a brand new pickup. And <laughs> the guy that cut meat for a living. I mean, he lived in a nice house. He drove a nice pickup. He could afford to put his kids through college, just like the farmers of that day. But the meat cutters of that day made good livings, and it was a it was a proud profession, mm -hmm. and and so now we are where we are. And and I often say we have now made in nineteen or nineteen ninety six when we filed the case against IBP. Uh, I've done a lot of writing. You can read about it on my blog at mycalculate.com. But but I've done a lot of writing, and we have now made the full return to the jungle of nineteen oh six that Upton Sinclair talked about. Yeah. Where workers are exploited, where the environment is polluted, uh, where, where independent companies are, are forced out of business because of monopoly power, of, of shared monopoly power of a few meat packers. We are back, only now it's worse. Yeah. Now it's even more concentrated. Four firm concentration is over 85%. And two of the big beef packers are foreign owned, Brazilian owned. And basically they're, they're objective was to get a conduit into the United States by way of our infrastructure, which they purchased way below the cost of, of, of replacement to bring in their really cheap meat from South America. And this is Mark and JBS. So there's a couple things before we get too uh, far down there. Uh, one, I just wanna let folks know that the history of America and what our founding fathers wanted was a protection from monopolies. The the Boston Tea Party was a rejection of uh, the East India Trading uh, Company, which was a monopoly. And Thomas Jefferson in the First Amendment wanted to have protection from monopoly in, in the First Amendment. And so this is deep in uh, being more democratic in, 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 in what the U.S., uh, the pillars of the U.S. Uh, stood for. And so uh, this is not uh, uh, some radical or anything like that. This is this is what our country was founded on and, and was warned that we should not have uh, such concentrated power. And so uh, this is, and we had this battle a hundred years ago and we had two Republican presidents. We had first uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt had 45 antitrust lawsuits. A lot of that dealt with agriculture and the second uh, followed up by Taft who had 90 antitrust lawsuits. And so uh, this is, this is deep, rooted uh, in our history. And, and so, they were really the guys responsible for the consent decree of 1920 and the Packers and Stockyards Act of 1921, which did break up that monopoly. Yeah, which you're absolutely right about the reason we declared independence from England is that we were dealing with the Crown and the East India Company. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, Ben Franklin even said, he said, if there's three ways to accumulate wealth, you can conquer it like the Romans did, or you can steal it like corporations do. And, and, and what, what corporation was he talking about? The East India Company that, that, was, that was basically an alliance with, with the crown. And so they were, they were extracting wealth from the colonies. But you know what else Ben Franklin said? He said, the third way to accumulate wealth is through farming. Add a seed in the soil and as if in a continual miracle, add sunshine and water, and as if in a continual miracle, wealth is created. Well, the big corporations know that. And so it's, a, it's up to Cargill, JBS, uh, uh, Tyson, Smithfield, to extract that wealth. And they position themselves to do so. And, and as you said, concentrated wealth is the greatest threat throughout history, the greatest threat to human, to human society concentrated power and wealth, because with wealth comes power. And so Iowa is a place to go to get rich if you're a corporation. It's a place to extract the wealth, to, stay, to steal the crops that are produced. And in order to do that, you need to go to Congress, hand out a few dollars to the, to the congressmen and the senators, and get some policy that is in line with your objective. And that's precisely what has happened in the last 40 years. And we have got a Congress today that represents big corporate power over independent businesses and, and, and citizens. And, and one thing that I, I want to talk about uh, now, too, is not only is it these multinational uh, corporations dictating a lot of things that happen on our farms, but it's also foreign multinational corporations. It, it's it's uh, China owns one in four hogs in the U.S. Uh, and over 400 farms. Uh, Brazil and JBS and, and uh, National Beef and what they're um, um, uh, doing here as well. And so uh, one of the things that I think we talk about a lot is if we're going to be a secure nation, we need to be a food secure nation. And so when you have that foreign influence, we lose out on a, a lot of uh, local things around here and, and being able to feed ourselves. And we talk about that with, with um, uh, it, I mean, that goes along with country of origin labeling, uh, which is a huge thing. If I eat uh, Iowa beef, I want it to be from Iowa, you know? Well, currently the country of origin labeling thing is worse than you would think. We not only don't have it, but we have a system that has been approved by USDA to allow foreign beef that comes into our country to be marked product of the USA as it crosses our borders. And so the consumers are really being deceived. It's fraudulent, it, it's deceptive. And for USDA to be all upset with independent meat packers and small operations that they're just too expensive to provide inspection to and you know, trying to hold them accountable for every, every letter that's on their, on their labels, they let the big meat packers, the Batista brothers with JBS, Marfrig out of Brazil, of course, JBS is out of Brazil. We let uh, the Chinese with Smithfield come in and literally take over our food system. You know, back in, what was it, the 80s, uh, that Barbara Tuchman wrote the book, The March of Folly. And it basically, it was instances that she cited in that book of where governments acted contrary to their own self-interest when better alternatives were clearly apparent. And I remember when JBS bought Swift, which is the old Montfort ConAgra plant in, in Greeley, that was the headquarters, and they bought all those holdings. Someone did a cartoon of the Trojan horse. And one of the, one of the examples Barbara Tuchman did in her book was the Trojan horse. Why in the world would they pull that horse in through the gates of Troy without looking inside? <laughs> all there had to be was one person inside the horse to open the gates and let the army in, and, and they were defeated because the gates were their protection. And so someone did an, a, a cartoon, and in fact, I've still got it. And it's, and it's the Trojan horse with JBS as a, as a logo on the side of the horse. And this is clear back when they first bought uh, the Swift uh, uh, and, and ConAgra companies. And, and so we have been on a constant march of folly since Ronald Reagan said, we don't need antitrust anymore. And, and we, we've been, we have just made it worse and worse every year. And, and of course, we've, we've destroyed our environment. Uh, we've destroyed our soil health. We've, we've polluted our water. We've, we've ruined our air quality. 
And you think about now how that impacts human health with the current COVID, we're far more susceptible to disease than we have been in the past because our environment is so broken. Yeah. One, one of the things that I'm starting to see, or what we saw probably three weeks ago, uh, was a lot of politicians, especially politicians who have been around for a while, start throwing their hands up and calling for an investigation on price fixing. Um, I would also like to say that this, in, in something that you've pointed out quite clearly, this did not start with COVID-19. <laughs> this has been here for a while. And so for a lot of folks, to, especially these politicians who uh, are, are crying foul now, where have they been for the last 20 plus years? And, well, this and so, actually, yeah. JD, this actually started, if you really want to know, it, this actually started in around 1975 in the mid seventies when IBP, uh, very back then, not, not, a, not the, not a huge uh, company like they are today with Tyson, but, but certainly a, a, a fast growing and, and aggressive company brought in the Boston, a Boston consulting group to advise them on how to get bigger, faster, better, and all of that. And basically the result of that meeting, according to an executive price, an executive vice president who was in attendance, uh, was that you should cooperate, not compete. And so here we are being played for fools this entire time by the big three, maybe big four at times meat packers, and they have literally swindled us. They have literally played a game of markets. There, mar there has not been any real markets. It's been whatever IBP as a price leader wanted to do in cooperation with the other big guys. And there has been no antitrust law enforcement. I mean, even, even in your, your state of Iowa, Neil, uh, Neil uh, the, the uh, Congressman- uh, Neil Smith. Neil Smith led that big investigation of which John Helmuth was a part of, who is one of my people who I look up to a lot, who's no longer with us, but they couldn't get it then. And I mean, it was in your face. I mean, it was nothing but price fixing, market manipulation and collusion of the big meat packers. And so you see what happened in, in uh, Garden City, Kansas last fall with the fire. And I mean, they just slammed the, the cattle market. And, and, and shot the box beef market up big time. And, and we all, we had to stop the stealing rally in Omaha. Nobody's listening. And, and I just want to let, for folks who are viewing, to let them know on this a little bit. So there last, um, uh, last fall, I think it was, there was right. a fire in, in the plant in Garden City, Kansas, and it affected the whole market. And one of the reasons it affected it so dramatically is because there's only 50 plants in the entire United States that produce 98% of our beef. Right. And, yeah. Right. And, and, the, and, the other, and the other problem is, is these 50 plants run at 100% capacity mm -hmm. unless they open on, on, unless they kill on Saturday, in which case it's 115% <laughs> capacity. And so if anything ever goes wrong, we're screwed. I mean, this is how vulnerable our food system has become as it becomes so so totally centralized. And you know, as Americans, the word centralized has a, has a special meaning uh, when you think about the Russians and, and their centrally planned systems. You know, we don't like that. We like decentralization. We like lots of people making decisions. We like freedom. You know, we, we want a very decentralized economy because we know it's the safest economy. And we also know that it's the kind of economy that rewards the worker and the farmer and, and the people who make and grow things. And, and so this is something we've completely got away from with our new form of government, which represents corporate power, monopoly power of, of a handful of corporations. And, and I think that's a good segue of, of how we got connected. I read your, I believe it was on Mother's Day, uh, your post, about where we can go in, in with this. And you have a three-step approach to it on, on just an, an option for what we can do going forward. And the first is enforcing our antitrust law. Um, and, and for folks who can't read my shirt, uh, this is America needs farmers, farmer needs antitrust. Uh, it's a huge part of my campaign, but, but um, do you just wanna talk about uh, yeah. your, your, that article and kind of uh, sure. what do you see we can do forward going forward 
And I think I think really one of the first steps is to recognize that we haven't enforced the antitrust laws for basically a hundred years uh, since they were written, and and we have to do that now. We have to do that. And and but the but because we've waited so long, we now really have to go a lot farther, and we have to break them up. We have to have a breakup of the big monopoly power in this country, and 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 there's a plan. I mean, we know how to do it. I mean, if you look at the consent decree of 1920, uh, the government can take over these plants. We can operate these plants and do it at a, at a rate that workers aren't being uh, at risking their lives. Uh, and, and we've got to do it in a way that the, that, the cattle pe that the cattle producer isn't losing his ranch and having to euthanize beef cattle. Uh, and we shouldn't be euthanizing all these hogs and chickens except for the model doesn't work if something breaks. And, and so, we, we need to break up the, the concentrated monopoly power in order for a new system to grow. And so the first thing you do is you break up the big meat packers, uh, you take them over, you, you, you operate them if you have to, and you most likely will. And, and then you start thinking about what should the ranch share of the consumer dollar be? What should the worker share of the consumer dollar be? Because there's honestly never been more money in the food business. There's money in the food business. It's just not going to the right places. It's going to buy Gulfstream jets. It's going to multi, multi-million dollar salaries for top executives. It's going to ridiculous returns to shareholders. Equity in these, in these companies return on equities is, is double digit. Cisco, the last report I got in March on Cisco, food, the biggest food distribution company in, in, the, in the country, 42% return on equity. Retailers getting 30 some percent return on equity, meat packers 17% return on equity. No competitive market would ever allow that. And so we have to step in and we have to take it over and we have to redistribute it and, and actually run these plants better than they're being run today. And, and alongside that effort, there needs to be a Manhattan project, equivalent of the Manhattan project to rebuild local regional food infrastructure and tie that local food infrastructure with a fair market. And I'd like to see that be things like a public market in the city, like the Reading Terminal Market in Philadelphia, where 70 some vendors are, have access to the direct sales to the public. And I'd add on to that a carcass processing facility with windows you can see in, and you can see the cutters working away at living wages, putting meat on the tables of our cities and urban centers and having all kinds of options and choices of all, everything you can imagine from grass fed to, to grain finished to all kinds of different uh, species, diversify the farms again. And all we have to do to make that happen is to allow them to make money doing what they do in the farming and ranching and livestock producing industries. And, and so, and so we, we, we break them up and we rebuild new as fast as we possibly can. For these trillions that we're throwing out there into the economy today, if we could direct just a small fraction of that into this kind of work, you talk about golden goose. I mean, these types of infra infrastructure would accelerate the wealth creation in America. But at the same time, we would re be restoring our environment's health, our soil health, our, our people's health with good food again and clean air, clean water, and and, and clean environment. We could change the world. This industrial model of agriculture is the current day march of folly. This industrial model of agriculture extracts, it gives nothing back, it leaves nothing but waste and, and, and destruction throughout our rural communities. And, and we can fix that right now if we will do it. But we, like I've heard you say, it takes policy it takes the right policy in Washington. We've got to make it easy to do the right thing and very, very hard to do the wrong thing. And we have got just the opposite today in Washington. We are serving the interests of a handful of corporations, of big companies, Monsanto, chemical companies. Uh, we're serving all of the interests of the most powerful uh, among us right now instead of the people. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I would like, uh, for you to talk about is, so I'm from Iowa, you're from Colorado, we're, we're in the Midwest and agriculture is all around us. 
what about for consumers, uh, whether it's in Florida or California or Oregon or, or elsewhere, uh, how does how does this concentration of power affect them at the grocery store? This concentration of power takes away their choices. It risks them being hungry. It risks the fact that those shelves may be empty. Were they? Were they empty in March? They still are in many places. This system has the risk of starvation built into it. And this impacts people more in urban centers than it does in rural communities. And I, I remember back during the uh, Spanish flu, I don't remember, but in reading about the Spanish flu, most of our people in America lived on farms or their grandfather was a farmer or, their, or they had access to grandma's fruit and, and vegetable cellar, uh, canned goods. Uh, we, that's all gone today. It's just in time business. It's all about efficiency and throughput, economies of scale and, and stupid stuff that, that only benefits those on Wall Street and, and, uh, and uh, Sao Paulo and Beijing right now today. So we've really got to build an economy that serves the people. And, and we need to, we need to buy and we need to be centralized so we can serve these urban centers. But you just think about that, that Reading Terminal Market in Philadelphia. And if you really understand the, the city of Philadelphia, they don't much care for chains. I don't think they're gonna, they're gonna promote a whole lot of dollar stores and Walmarts in their city. But this market is impressive. It's so beautiful. And I mean, it's full of people, it's jamming. It's, it's, it's got a lot of energy in it. And, and there's vendors that honestly can't fail if they, if they just can breathe and, and, and show a little bit of effort. They just simply can't fail because they are in an environment that's supportive. And today it's just the opposite. We live in a, in, a, in a place with nothing but predators. And this is why I say you got to enforce antitrust laws. And, and once you build this new system, then that third step is you have to protect it. You have to protect it. You can't just let predators come back in and wipe them out again. And, and, yeah. and so the, the people in the urban centers have the most to lose and, and are, are the most at risk with an industrial food system. And, and what would happen if, if we moved more people back to rural communities? where honestly, it's a whole lot nicer, less stressful, potentially a better life and clean out some of these cities a little bit. And by reducing some of the pollution in cities, we also reduce our, our risk of, of, of health related illnesses. So we, we can really make the world a better place if we just get better policy and, and all just get back involved again as citizens instead of these ridiculous price shopping consumers aggressive price shopping consumers that really the, the Walmart company has been most responsible for creating. Yeah, and, and in our district, what I'm seeing, uh, we did a Don't Forget About Us tour in going to all 39 counties in towns of under a thousand people last fall. And in doing that, what we saw was one of the number one things people talked about was trying to just keep their local grocery store alive because Dollar General's coming in and undercutting them and Dollar General doesn't sell fresh produce or, or fresh uh, uh, meats or anything like that. And here we are in, this, in the uh, second most agriculture producing district in America. And we have our, our so-called grocery store is a place that doesn't have fresh produce or fresh meat. And, it's, and when our farmers aren't making a dime, you kind of you scratch your head and wondering who are we doing this for? And you know, I talk about Walmart killing and consuming the prey, Main Street small business. The dollar stores consume the decaying remains. Mm -hmm. So dollar store shows up in your community, it's over. And you are there now living in the secondhand economy. And all you have to do to keep that is support it. All you got to do to have a Walmart is buy stuff at it. And all you got to do to have a local grocery store is, is buy things there. But we've been trained for so many generations now to be aggressive price shoppers. You know, it's like a sport. And, and you know, we get together and we, we, I remember when I was a kid growing up, you know, my friend's father was beating up the car salesman, you know, and by God, going to get the last dime out of this car salesman. And that's just the way it was when I was a kid. And, and you know, we've had 50 some years of that kind of stupid behavior. Instead of going to the guy and saying, look, what do you need for a car? And, and, he's, and, he, and then and saying, great, you know, and hey, 
if you could do this or that, would I'll, I'll pay you a little bit more maybe. I, I remember when I was growing some wheat uh, in St. Francis, Kansas, I was busy at the feedlot and had no time to do my own farming or my own planting that year. And so I called one of the local farmers that I knew just got a brand new drill, a big, wide, brand new drill. And I said, hey, Gary, uh, could, you, could you plant my, my wheat for me? Because I, And I knew he probably could use the acres. And he said, sure, I, yeah, I can plant the wheat. I says, well, what do you, what do you charge? Yeah. And he said, well, I charge like whatever, six fifty dollars or seven bucks an acre to plant the wheat. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, Gary, what I would like to do with you is if you could pick the wheat seed up at the elevator where it's being cleaned, if you could drill my acres and then take whatever seeds left over back and sell it at the elevator, I would really appreciate it. And, and, I, and I'm going to leave it up to you because I know you are a really good farmer and you'll take care of it. And for that, I'll pay you an extra 15%. Uh, I'm not going to pay you seven dollars. I'm going to I'm going to pay you more than seven dollars, and and I you know I had I probably had one of the best wheat crops uh, that year in the county. Uh, I mean my wheat he he drilled my wheat first when the moisture was perfect. I mean this is what you can get if you can stop that if you can recover from that horrible killer disease called aggressive price shopping consumerism. Yeah, yeah. W with that, uh, I'll wrap things up here. Uh, this is a great conversation. I think one that is more and more, uh, again, because of COVID-19, there's been a spotlight on our broken food system, but the reality is, is that it's been broken for years and we need change. Uh, in doesn't matter where you live, this affects you here in America. And so um, uh, one of the things that we talk about consistently is, again, America needs farmers, farmers need antitrust. If we're gonna allow farmers to stay on their land and make a dime, we need to change the policies. This get bigger, get off the farm policy uh, we've been doing for decades. We, we, we need to adjust and adjust uh, so it allows for small farmers, allow for big farmers, allow for uh, a, a lot of us to uh, get back to the basics in a lot of this, to allow for these small towns that have, are struggling to, uh, with what we're suggesting here today, it will allow a lot of these small towns and we talk about rural revitalization. This is the key. This is the start. This is if we create this alternative um, uh, uh, for pennies on the dollar, we can invest in this. Uh, uh, we'll still uh, do a lot of uh, international trade and all that stuff, but, but this small little section could just drastically change rural America and, and how we eat and how um, um, just how we buy and all that stuff. And so, uh, Mike, let, let me give you a number. Let me give you a number, uh, JD. We kill, say, 30 million steers, fat steers and heifers in our country today. Based upon our loss of our share of the consumer dollar, that's well over $1,000 a head loss to every single rancher and farmer that produces calves in this country. So let's just say you have a 100 head of cows. That's 100,000 a year of lost income. If we can restore that, pay workers more, charge consumers fair prices for their food, not more than what they're paying today, most certainly, that will change America. That will change rural America. And like Ben Franklin said, these are the wealth creators. If you feed them, they will feed you. That's exactly right. I think that's a great comment to end on. Mike, thank you so much for your time. Folks, if you want to follow his blog, he has a, a lot of uh, words of wisdom that I would like to say. So uh, thanks so much, Mike, for your time. And thank you all for watching. Thanks, JD.